in all of the scenarios, all of the high level scenarios, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so working what's called Working Group Three of the IPCC, all of their scenarios, and indeed, really all of the all of the major global high level scenarios, and these are you know um, scenarios about the future in terms of usually in terms of energy and emissions, they all rely on some form of carbon dioxide removal, and we these terms now chip off our tongue as if they're perfectly reasonable things to discuss carbon dioxide removal negative emission technologies and, and increasingly even the language of geoengineering but these things aren't material particularly the negative emissions and the geoengineering they're not they're not actually material things you can go out and get and buy at scale they are at very best very small pilot schemes that you know that capture a few thousand tons here and there you know but set against the fact is that we're emitting around about 36 to 37 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year from burning fossil fuels these technologies are just capturing you know, just a few thousand tons. There's absolutely no way that you can scale these things up from just being you know, very small pilot schemes, often with, with you know, a very checkered technical history, that you can scale these things up in a timeline that matches the carbon budgets that come out of the science that relate to 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade. And yet we evoke them as if somehow they are they can be aligned. They cannot be aligned. In fact, they've undermined the narrative, I would argue, for the last at least 10 to 15 years, if not 20 years. So the adoption of these sorts of technologies, and it's not they're not the only ones, they're not only these technologies that are, that are planned to remove our, our carbon dioxide, to suck the carbon dioxide, hundreds of billions of tons, you know, up to sort of half a trillion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and bury it securely underground in a timely manner. But the assumption of that has actually done the oil company's job for them. It has allowed us to, to, to postulate ongoing fossil fuel use, to avoid major profound political, um, social change. So I, I, in this, and I have made this point before, I think the, the big, what I've often referred to as integrated assessment models, whilst I think a lot of the modelers are, are good people doing as objective work as they can, the, the, the boundaries they work within are deeply subjective. And they have actually done you know, the job of Exxon for the last 20 years by undermining the narratives we've needed to have to start to address climate change. So, and I think that these have been so normalized now that when you talk about them and, and that they may not work as is assumed, you almost seem to be an extremist. So you're an extremist because you're pointing out that these technologies that barely exist are completely relied on the models. That seemed to be the extreme position rather than the extreme position being, how on earth can it be that virtually every single model run that we have rely on these either technologies or some other use of what, you know, the awful term of nature-based solutions. I mean, the, you know, the, the language we use, it sort of captures something and makes it all sound so neat that we can simply put it into the accountancy spreadsheet that under, underpins these models. And hey, presto, we can, we can um, evoke wonderful low carbon futures that occur almost overnight. It's, and the journalists have allowed this to happen. A lot of the senior academics have allowed this to happen. And I think it comes back to them a point earlier that actually often as experts, we're very good at reductionist thinking, but we're not very good at systems thinking.